So I'm the founder and CEO of Hummingbird Technologies. Um, I'm going to keep this quite high level and quick uh, to make up the time. Um, we are an artificial intelligence business for, for arable farming. Um, we, we only began two and a little bit years ago. So it only takes sort of one or two white papers for us to get to where we are today, which is um, 35 full-time people just down the road in Soho, uh, most of which are engaged in, in data science. Um, I, I want to talk about machine learning and some of the technologies that are so out there and, and progressing so fast um, that I think a lot of what we all hope will come in the future is actually already here and, and we all need to get a move on, really. Um, so we're the leading machine learning business in, in, in UK arable farming by, by far now, probably. Um, we've got just under 200,000 hectares of, of paying clients. Um, there are 50 pilots today flying in the UK. Um, and we also have planes and satellites and drones serving our customers in, in Russia and Ukraine <laughs> today as well, and, and also in Brazil. Um, we moved to Australia in, in, in August, um, and an overseas expansion for a British-based technology business is, is absolutely key um, to all of this. Um, we use um, imagery from, from drones and satellites and planes um, to help farmers detect things like early disease and, and weeds in their crops. Um, so one of our metrics is, is, is the accuracy of those algorithms. So we've done 12,000 flights or something just in the UK alone, and we're about 85, 90% accurate on the things that we, that we sell. Um, there are lots of the things that we do behind the scenes, like try to predict yield in nationwide crops that aren't quite there yet. Um, but, but, but there is lots of low-hanging fruit that data science can bring this sector that, 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 that really moves the productivity needle um, for customers. Um, this is what the sensor on the drone looks for. Um, we fly um, drones at an altitude of just over 100 foot. We use hyperspectral and multispectral sensors. That captures imagery down to about two centimeters per pixel. Um, and we are looking for spectral signatures that um, isolate uh, weeds from healthy crop or um, are looking for things like a lesion on a leaf that may indicate early stress. Um, that data is then uploaded to a cloud, it comes back onto a smartphone, is compatible with all farm machinery, and as the sprayer goes over the crops, it literally just sprays more chemicals on areas that need it, and hopefully none on areas that don't. Um, the idea being is that you use less chemicals for the same yield, or the same chemicals for higher yield. It is a very basic, um, optimal productivity equation. Um, you know, without Hummingbird, the time and the cost of managing large land holdings is a burden. Um, you know, we have 100 customers in this country. They, they tend to be the big boys, um, the most progressive. Sometimes they're backed by big industry because um, a map of a potato field isn't just interesting to a potato grower because PepsiCo are also interested in it. So are the irrigation companies and the chemical companies and maybe even the food retailers. So sometimes our customers and our users are different groups, um, but ultimately we're all trying to, to make better decisions in a field and we're all trying to communicate better to each other so that that relationship between um, grower and customer um, is reduced through the technology. This is really what it looks like from a diagrammatic perspective. Um, you know, we take data from weather stations, from his soil maps, from um, you know, farmers give us their own data. But we're not. We're a bit, a little bit different to other data companies because we we believe that we can add more value by creating new data. So we don't just say, give us your data, we're going to sell it to the chemical companies, and we're going to tell you what your field looks like. We actually like to create new data that is able to see things like yellow rust early in, in, in wheat, um, or that is able to measure canopy so accurately um, that it helps a grower um, with their own yield prediction. And that data is not just sitting around. You actually, rather annoyingly in our case, we have to send out pilots and 
drones, or we have to hire a plane to do it, or we have to connect through an API to a satellite. Um, now that was all um, investment uh, that was enabled by um, you know three three rounds. Now we're backed by the European Space Agency, Sir James Dyson, lots of venture capital funds. Um, even even Mr. Lee Ka Shing in Asia thinks that this will be a big deal, and, and I, I think we agree with him um, and, and our other pioneering investors because it is quite out there some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to send round a demo after, um, but. These are just some examples of, 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 of what the maps look like. So um, what we've got here, this is the easiest one. We developed um, a machine learning based plant counting tool. It's probably the most simple algorithm in our locker. Um, we capture up to 500 hectares per day of, of ground um, and we can measure and count the number of every single crop in that, in that area. So. It's very useful for um, you know, row-based growers in this country, for sugar beet and potato growers that want to see how well their crops established, to see early problems. Do I replant? Do I not? Do I have any, any pest damage? Do I not? Um, it's extremely interesting for corn growers in Russia and the Ukraine who really struggle with whether their crops even there at all. Um, and they're managing 70, 80, 90,000 hectares, and there's just five of them. So this is the first product in a whole series during the crop's life cycle. Um, as, as the canopy develops, we will be looking at um, early onset of, 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 of problems such as disease. Um, we'll also be monitoring the correlation between uh, canopy, vigor, um, and final yield. Um, so we have um, sort of a number of, of products and they have to have a, a, a meaning. So they have to have some productivity measurement. So on the right here, we have something, it's a bit blurred, but we have something called the green area index map that is a computer vision based uh, image classification tool, um, which literally measures how green a pixel is. Now, we understand that um, that has huge implications for your nitrogen application. And, and, and many of our customers believe that for years people have been overspraying nitrogen. So this is a way in which people can think about, I mean, so someone mentioned earlier, personalized nutrition. We think about fields and, and indeed plants in, this, in the same way. Um, each pixel is treated differently because there is too much variability within a field. Um, so there's, no, there's no reason why people should overspray if you have equipment that can adjust the rate at which chemicals are applied. Um, and, e and even the chemical companies are behind this. I mean, clearly, DEFRA and, and, and other actors in our industry, but um, even the chemical companies understand that the efficacy of their products um, is enhanced if it's used properly. Um, so we're at a real inflection point in terms of um, how crops are managed um, and the willingness for growers to, to experiment, um, albeit at the pioneering end of the equation. Um, so this is where we are so far. Um, I think the, the presentation's loaded quite quickly because this looks like sort of 300 years apocalyptic. Um, <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio is, is quite literally tearing his hair out. Um, but um, look, we... I'm gonna. I'm, I'm actually gonna sort of sort of fast forward. So we're, you know, we're we're backed by some of the the biggest names in the industry. Um, you know, someone mentioned earlier, like getting the data is is the biggest challenge, but get, getting quality data is really the the most important thing. Um, you know, the models are um, so reliant on on not having garbage in because you get garbage out at the end. Um, and you know it is it is no accident that that um, you know you have to go to the likes of Cranfield and Imperial um, and Google to, to just to talk about some of this stuff because um, we we think at least in this country that you know if you really want a good machine learning engineer you have to go to DeepMind or maybe Imperial and UCL but. In terms of what what people can do, it's it, it's quite difficult. A lot of a lot of what we're trying to do and understanding plant pathology, bioinformatics, deep learning, crop modeling, image classification is quite a lot of skills in in one locker. Um, so 
So that's, that is a challenge. Um, and you, you also need a big team to do that. So here, herein lies sort of, you know, the, the big challenge 2.0. This is only some of our team. Um, and, you know, we've had to give away 75% of the company to get here. Now we could bumble along and get government grants and, 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 and what have you. But the reality is, unless you move fast, um, the competition will will get there ahead of you. Um, and if you're a US, US based company trying to do exactly what we're trying to do, um, you can probably go out and raise $10 million on day one with, with, with just a, a nice looking investment deck. Um, but as you can see there, this is, this is, this is a data science team. Um, but we all, we all love helping farmers. So we obsess about plants um, and helping farmers and enhancing food productivity. But we really are like technicians. Um, we believe that you can only learn one on the hoof. And, and maybe we're too techy, but um, it serves us well so far. So we're in the UK now. Um, we're growing about as fast as we can. Um, but, 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 but overseas expansion is huge. I think the UK is such an important test bed and template for us. You know, we, we, we measure things like crop height in the fens in, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of time over. And we measure biomass and then we take it overseas and help people predict yield in, in maize. Um, we have 28 disease trial sites all over the country, but we will be taking those learnings and, and, and going overseas. And the more we can do for UK farmers, the better along the way. Um, so I'm now going to whiz just to save, save, save you time, Colin. But, but um, I think what are the sort of risk, risks for us and big challenges? So one of them is, is, is funding. Um, we've, we've raised enough money for two years, but you know, we're spending a lot per month, um, and, and that's not going to stop. Um, and you can only subsidize so much by revenue. Um, I think a more annoying risk for us is, is, is regulatory. So when I look around and think, here are what all the universities in the country thinks, Here's what Greg Clark and Michael Gove think, and they're very supportive of us, both of them. Um, here's what you lot think. Here's what the commercial reality is. And then you've got the Civil Aviation Authority that, quite frankly, is 20 years behind. Um, and we have a lot of sort of hurdles to, to accelerating take up of technology in this country that, that perhaps, um, perhaps don't help those on the ground. Um, and I think that as much focus should be on, you know, perhaps looking, looking inward at the various institutions that, that perhaps place hurdles on, on businesses to, you know, because our, our costs would go down 70% if we were allowed to do that. And there's no one, there's no public safety risk in, in a field in Lincolnshire, as far as I can see. Um, but that's just a side analogy. It is challenging doing this stuff. It's, it's difficult. You, someone mentioned data privacy earlier. It's difficult navigating it and doing it honestly and doing it and helping people. It's hard. Um, I think, um, do you have enough data for machine learning? I mean, that's that's the hardest thing of all. It's you require just so much in terms of if I can think of um, one of our big problems is trying to identify black grass when it's only a few inches big. Um, so at a post-emergent spraying junction, um, that would save farmers literally hundreds of thousands in herbicide bills and, and the environmental positive consequences are obvious for all. Um, but understanding the spectral signature of a weed when it's barely visible to the human eye is, is a deeply complicated exercise. If you go onto Google and type in dog versus cat and see the training algorithms that, that those engineers built up over years, you'll see what I mean. So I just wanted to touch on just, just to end, some of the things that are, that are sort of really out there and, and how do we hack and how do we um, shortcut some of the growth to, to accelerate the sort of the data science um, efficacy. So one of them is we give farmers free satellite imagery, but if they help us validate things on the ground. So you can see there is our ground truthing validation app. So the image scouting features observe a, a problem in the field 
It might be disease, it might be pests. We already know what crops in the field, so we can narrow down what problems we think it is. And the farmer will validate it themselves. You then get thousands of labeled pixels that say, this is what brown rust is, or this is what blight is. And over time, you build up a very, very reliable um, training set. That's, that's one of the things that, that we're doing on a very mundane daily basis. So over time, you, you win, as long as you're feeding it the right data. Um, you can enhance this by um, trying to identify different species of crop and also different invas invasive species of crop. Now, it starts to get really complex when you're, you have to code how the healthy crop reacts to having an invasive species in its existing environment. So um, does a weed force the crop to outcompete the weed? Because otherwise you're, you're, you're thinking that it's healthy crop. So it's not straightforward and, and your code base has to respect this phenomenon. One of the other things we're doing, as I mentioned, is, 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 is looking at historic data sets to enhance the machine learning. So understanding the relationships between different soil types and different cropping rotations and, and that effect. Um, the more data you have, the better the models become. But the idea is to do it with none at all. This is a camera that we've used recently, and I'm gonna, I want you to remember this camera, and I'm, the final slide in three coming up is, is the image from it. Um, hyperspectral imaging. This is the domain of one institution in this room, Rothamsted. I don't believe anyone else is using it, but it's, 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 it's not something for, 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 for the small plot farmer um, yet. But what you're able to do with it is, is phenomenal. Um, identifying the different spectral signatures of diseases at different growth stages and being able to differentiate between different problems in the field will move the needle so much more than the two point something percent the French are managing. Um, and we will be in sort of real Dutch territory um, if this becomes adopted and it works. Um, but it is very expensive. Um, it's sort of 50 to 100 grand for a sensor alone. And if you divide that over, you know, all the hectares in, in Lincolnshire, you're still looking at something that's, that's, that's a burden. Um, LIDAR. <clears throat> so one of the advantages of having a tech team and not an agricultural team is that some of our data scientists were asking why we were always looking at the crops above ground. And when we're looking at um, root vegetables, and potatoes and sugar beet and so forth. I think we're already experimenting ways in which we can actually use um, uh, light or canopy penetrating light and radar sensors, um, ground penetrating sensors that we've borrowed and hacked from the mining industry to understand what crops look like under the ground. Um, it, it's, it's quite exciting some of this stuff when you think about what that will mean for the food chain in particular um, and the logistics around it. I think that will be the last missing piece in the puzzle. Um, the farm bit of the farm to fork will be so well understood. So my final slide. People always talk about Moore's Law and every two years resistor um, doubling capacity and, and so forth. But in the space of one year, we've gone from the top right to down here in terms of available UAV mounted sensors. So that was 1.0 and satellites give you worse than that. So that's, a, that's actually an image we took in, the, in Ukraine of a sunflower crop. You obviously can't really count it because it's not um, clear enough. There are too many errors in the imagery. You can use this. This is what we use for plant counting and basic canopy assessments all up and down the country. We have a number of customers in the room. It's, it's, it works. But, but this is, I mean, I could zoom in on this all day. And I think we took it from a WhatsApp group this morning from our internal one. But it, you can see a ladybird on the leaf. And that, that works. It's, it works today. And when we're talking about productivity and you know, moving the needle and the four industrial challenges, I would, I would encourage people to think of data science as a moving goalpost in terms of the quality of the data that you're able to capture with, with other forms of new technology, such, such as high resolution sensors and, and so forth, is, is astonishing.
Um, and some of the work we do with, with NASA and the European Space Agency around cloud penetrating satellites and just imagine a world in which satellites get that resolution. Um, so um, I, don't, I suppose my only parting message is, is, is to um, take comfort that it is coming. And the faster we are and the more money we spend and the quicker we encourage people to adopt it will only get people in the best... Um, position for the long term because it, I mean it's coming unequivocally so um, thank you very much for having me and enjoyed speaking to you all. Thanks very much Will. Exciting things ahead even if not now. Um, any questions? Let's take a quick question. There must be. Yes. Okay. Microphone's just coming. How do you deal with all those thorny issues around um, data, privacy, and trust, and sharing farmers' data? Um, it's, it's quite easy for us because we're just very black and white in that we don't sell any data. The farmer owns their own data. It's funny because we collect 40 million data points per field. It's of immense interest to that grower, but it's not really that interesting um, to others. Um, so we, we don't have a bridge to cross in that sense yet, but we like the fact that we're independent. We value our customer relationships clearly above everything. Um, and we have no interest in, in commercializing that part of the business. So it's quite an easy conflict to avoid. One final question, Dave. Uh, I yeah, Super, thank you. Um, you said at the very beginning you work very much with arable uh, farmers. Is there a reason why you're not working with dairy or beef? Is it because there's no money in mm. that? Or is it because it represents a more difficult kind of system? So it's, it's funny you ask that, but my mother's a plant pathologist. And I think she spent six years looking at the oak processionary moth at Kew Gardens. And I think that just goes to show if you want to do this stuff properly, you have to focus. And understanding um, that different crops and different problems within crops have an entirely different stack in terms of the code base. You know, you're not going to have a quality product unless you acknowledge that. And we would love to do livestock. I mean, some of our biggest customers in Australia and Brazil are enormous livestock owners, but um, it's just too, we, we, we like what we're doing at the moment, basically. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Thanks. Will. Yeah. Right.